The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. For the international community, China's expansionist policies are a growing cause for concern. From President Xi Jinping's vow to achieve peaceful reunification with Taiwan, to Beijing's aggressive actions in the South China Sea and beyond, the status quo seems in danger of shifting in China's favor. These are just some of the questions that will be addressed by our panel of experts as they debate the pressing issue of China's global ambitions, and how the world might respond. Please join the live discussion, bringing your questions, comments and insights. Hello and welcome wherever you are in the world. I'm Humphrey Hawksley, your moderator for our November Democracy Forum debate on an issue that more and more is on everyone's minds. Unlike so many other political issues, we're beginning to realize that this one will not leave the headlines anytime soon, anytime this century probably. From Greenland to Fiji, it doesn't go away. The crisis in Afghanistan, infrastructure in Nicaragua, it's always there. At so many levels impacting our lives, where the big power plays with sanctions and aircraft carriers to literally the clothes on our backs and the phones in our pockets. Our Democracy Forum debate today, Cold War or Confrontation? Understanding China's global ambitions. The world has never been in a situation before where two opposing value systems are constantly lambasting each other while being economically entwined, even joined at the hip, skirting around like medieval knights, staking their ground for contest. And naturally, we fall back on what we know, good and evil, cold war and hot war, democracy and dictatorship. And we can be forgiven for being confused. One moment we read about Nazi-style concentration camps and lethal hypersonic missiles, the next, we discovered that the Chinese and American climate envoys have been working around the clock in a makeshift office in Glasgow to forge an agreement between the two most powerful and most openly antagonistic nations on Earth. To debate and hopefully answer these questions, we have a highly experienced and knowledgeable panel, Steve Jung, Didi Kirsten Tatlow, Martin Thorley, and Yuka Kobayashi. Send in your questions, comments, ideas, experiences, and I'll pass them into the panel, feed them into the debate, and we'll discuss, answer, or challenge them. Summing up, we'll be the chair of the Democracy Forum and member of the British Parliament, Barry Gardner, a veteran of grassroots democracy, and from his many jobs in politics, an expert in China, the Indo-Pacific trade and climate. And we begin, as usual, with our grounding force, Democracy Forum President Lord Charles Bruce, who with his usual clarity will lay out the canvas for our debate today. Lord Bruce, thank you. The screen is yours. Welcome to this webinar this afternoon hosted by the Democracy Forum. I'd like to thank everyone at the Forum for organizing the event and for arranging such an eminent panel to address you. I'm very grateful to each panelist for agreeing to take part 
to enlighten us with their perspectives on such a critical topic and to share their insights with us. And I'd like to take this opportunity too to thank Humphrey Hawksley for yet again allowing us to make use of his skill and perspicacity as a moderator. For those of you who are watching the diplomatic tension that inevitably appears to accompany the dialogue between the Chinese Communist Party and the US government, the virtual encounter between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden last week may come to be seen as a climacteric moment when this chapter of history comes to be written. Asked for his reaction to the conference, a senior Chinese professor of foreign affairs interviewed by the Financial Times said, the video call suggests that China-US relations have at last finally reached bottom. Now the relationship is more about competition than confrontation or conflict. However, the fear of confrontation or conflict no longer seems such a dim, faraway prospect. In August, the Pentagon was alerted by reports that the People's Liberation Army had successfully deployed a hypersonic capable nuclear missile on two or perhaps three occasions in the previous fortnight. On hearing the news, General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said, I don't know if it's quite a Sputnik moment, but I think it's very close to that. And he added, it's a very significant technological event or test that occurred by the Chinese, and it has all our attention. And last month, the Pentagon reassessed its view of China's long range missile inventory, concluding that the PLA is on course to quadruple its stockpile of intercontinental weapons by the end of the decade to reach a thousand warheads far outstripping earlier estimates. And in a further revelation, the Pentagon now acknowledges that China is close to achieving a partial launch on warning posture, enabling an effective counter-strike rather than simply waiting to retaliate. It's not clear, however, if the Biden administration shares the Pentagon's anxiety that America's dominant power status is now clearly threatened by the demonstration of China's military capability. Early this month, two senior ranking congressmen wrote jointly to the United States Secretary of State and Defense, expressing their alarm that the White House had circulated a questionnaire to its international allies to gauge their opinion on its intention to self-impose controls on the future deployment of US nuclear warheads in wartime. The letter suggested that by adopting a posture of sole purpose or no first strike, the United States would be taking a major risk in abandoning its policy of strategic ambiguity. Michael Gallagher, a congressman serving on the Armed Services Committee said, the Biden administration has said they want to reduce the role of US nuclear forces in our defense capabilities. Well, that's exactly opposite of what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. And he added, I hope General Millet is making his concerns clear to the president because we can't afford to be asleep at the wheel for one second longer. Any suggestion that the United States is asleep at the wheel in the face of a relentless escalation of Chinese military preparedness is deeply unsettling to many countries in South Asia, in Southeast Asia. Caitlin Talmadge, a nuclear expert at Georgetown University, argues that China is not developing its nuclear forces for some bolt out of the blue attack on America, but instead is trying to lock the United States and China into a deeper mutual vulnerability stalemate so that the US cannot play the nuclear card in a conventional war, for example, over Taiwan. Writing a couple of weeks ago, the Financial Times Washington correspondent suggests that military leaders in Washington face two critical questions. Is China pivoting to a less defensive approach that has the potential significantly to alter the balance of power in East Asia? And could this enable China to win a conflict with the US over Taiwan by neutralizing the threat uh, from American nuclear weapons. 
Robert Sufa of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, who served as a military advisor to the Trump administration, concedes that Japan, South Korea, or Taiwan could develop nuclear weapons, or they could start to accommodate China, he says. China's strategy to expand its regional hegemony and influence and try to peel off allies from the US make the more nervous the allies become, the more they accommodate China. And interviewed last month for his view on China's military assertiveness, the Secretary General of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, explained the view of the West's oldest military alliance, representing 30 countries. We don't regard China as an enemy or an adversary, he said. But at the same time, they now have the second largest defense budget in the world. They have the biggest navy in the world. They will soon have the biggest economy in the world. They coerce their neighbors. We see how they are behaving in the South China Sea, and they actually bully countries which are not behaving as they want. Perhaps the purpose of NATO's foundation over 70 years ago offers a relevant model for a collective security approach to anticipating and containing China's military ambition in the Asia-Pacific Asia region. Following the announcement of the formation of AUKUS in September, the security analyst Antoine Bondaz commented that for China, the pact between Washington, Canberra and London is the realization of a long-standing fear, the multilateralization of American alliances in the region. Today, it's Australia and the United Kingdom. Tomorrow, maybe Japan will join. Well, welcome to the webinar. Please feel free to put your questions and comments to the panel. Lord Charles Bruce, thank you very much. The fear of confrontation or conflict no longer a dim, faraway prospect and unsettling about US preparedness. Thoughts for us all, Cold War or confrontation? We're going to begin with Professor Steve Jung, Director, China Institute at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, and a familiar face on voice uh, and radio and television, author and contributor to many books specializing in 20th century Chinese history, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and much more. I've asked Steve to start off because he's going to be addressing China's global strategy on the basis of Xi Jinping thought, how President Xi has brought ideology back to the People's Republic, and with one aim, to make the world a safer place for authoritarian regimes. Steve Jung, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Humphrey, and also to the Democracy Forum for this uh, opportunity. Indeed, I will be focused very much on China's global strategy, which is based on Xi Jinping thought. And the objective of this global strategy is to secure the uninterrupted rise of China. And I would say that there are a few key features that define this Chinese approach. The first is in terms of how Xi Jinping brought, the, brought ideology back into China. Uh, if we look back in the last 30, 40 years of the reform and opening, we would get to a stage by the time Zhang Jimin and uh, Hu Jintao were leader in China, that people were jokingly saying that the CCP didn't really stand for the Chinese Communist Party. It perhaps would stand for the Chinese Confucius Party. The ideology was being seen as being put on the back burner, not being taken seriously. Xi Jinping clearly has changed that. He's made it very, very clear. He is a Chinese Marxist. And Xi Jinping thought is meant to be the ultimate rendition of Chinese socialism. It is both in Xi Jinping's interpretation, Marxist Leninist, and also very Chinese. Now, Xi Jinping is not a great Marxist, nor a great scholar of China's culture and history. So on both counts, they might not necessarily have met the test that academics would have said for being uh, either good Marxist or good Chinese. 
but he is the leader of China. When he say it is, this is what the party embraces, and this is what China is requires to do that. And in, in this rendition of Chinese Marxism, um, there is a promotion in incorporation of a party centric nationalism into this ideology, which portrays the Communist Party as the ultimate defender of China's tradition, that it is the Communist Party that make the people of China stand up, that make them rich. And now under Xi Jinping, he is going to make them powerful, great. And in so doing, Xi Jinping has basically put the Communist Party and its leader at the core of China's national interests. So when we look at the Chinese government look, uh, talking about national interests, core national interests, the most important of which is in fact the interests of the party or its leader, or perhaps in particular its leader. In spite of all these returns to Chinese Marxism, what is also clear, I think, from Xi Jinping's writings is that he does not actually aim to export his version of Chinese socialism. In some ways, Xi Jinping presents the people of China as a bit of a chosen people, very special, is only under the Communist Party with the Chinese that they're able to do what are being done in China. So Chinese Marxism is not quite for export in the way that uh, socialism was for export uh, from the Soviet Union and uh, at one stage Maoist China in the Cold War. I think there is something worth uh, thinking about, which is that on the one hand, ideology is back, but the ideology that Xi Jinping now focus on is not for export. What he is willing to export is the China Chinese experience. You can call it the China model. He prefers to call it the China solution. How much difference they really are, I think, is a good question to discuss. Because it is not really a revival of an ideological competition, I'll put it to you that we really perhaps should go beyond the Cold War uh, frameworks to look at the relationship with China. We are not looking at the same kind of ideological competition between China today and the capitalist West uh, on the other side. What we are looking at is an attempt at a beauty contest. Xi Jinping believes that the Chinese model under the Communist Party is clearly superior to what the American model is, or indeed what the democratic uh, approach of the West has. He believes China has a far better model for governance and for delivering services, and indeed for how it engages with the rest of the world. Let me move on and uh, talk about uh, what Xi Jinping's ambitions is. His ambition is encapsulated in the concept of the China dream, which was the first thing he talked about when he became leader of China in 2012. And what is the China dream? Xi Jinping explained that it is the China dream of national rejuvenation. To use plain English and quote from somebody that I do not particularly otherwise admire, Donald Trump, that is to make China great again. It is a very clear message that Xi Jinping is sending to people in China. He wants to make China great again. He requires people in China to support him to make China great again. What does that actually mean? what Xi Jinping wants to achieve is to make the world safe for authoritarianism, as the Americans had previously done, uh, at least until Donald Trump, and from Woodrow Wilson at the early 20th century, to make the world safe for democracy. Why is it 
necessary for China to make the world safe for authoritarianism? Because the Communist Party, and this precedes Xi Jinping, but is certainly still believed in by Xi Jinping, that the West, led by the United States, had a conspiracy, global conspiracy, particularly implemented after the collapse of communism in the uh, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which is the part of that uh, peaceful East evolution conspiracy and the ultimate goal, the ultimate color revolution that this Western conspiracy led by America, the United States wants to achieve is regime change in China. The last color revolution will be that of China. And if it, if it is a world that is safe for authoritarian systems, then it is a world where this global conspiracy, uh, peaceful conspiracy theory cannot be implemented. And the system of China under the Communist Party will be protected. But this is not just purely defensive. Xi Jinping wanting to make China great again also means that he wants to uh, assert a leadership role for China in the world, particularly at the United Nations and other international agencies. China now requests. Well, previously it requests, now it simply requires the rest of the world to pay it due respect. So Chinese diplomacy has taken on something very innovative, as Xi Jinping claimed at the Sixth Party, uh, the Sixth Party plenum when he issued the new resolution on history. It's innovative because it is now a kind of wolf warrior diplomacy, which of course is an oxymoron, it's a contradiction in itself. You cannot have a wolf warrior approach, which is diplomatic, but this is what they are trying to do. And finally, to, great, to make China great again, will require China to secure the return of territories it claims particularly the territory that the Chinese government has highlighted as its sacred territory, namely Taiwan. Knowing full well, if the Chinese government wants to take Taiwan, they will face resistance, which will also probably imply American intervention. And for China to successfully take Taiwan, it will either have to deter the United States from interfering or it will have to defeat the Americans sufficiently in order to get Taiwan back. And that will be a development that has enormous consequences because it will completely change the geopolitical balance of power in the, in the Indo-Pacific region and indeed beyond. Well, I will stop here um, and hand it back to Humphrey, but we're happy to engage with you on any aspect of the things that I have said. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much there. There were a couple of things that, that struck me uh, from that is the, the beauty contest concept and the not for export. So correct me if I'm wrong, as opposed to what we did, we, when I say we in the West went with from our gunboats to the Iraq invasion, we come in and say, this is what you have to do and we've got guns to prove it. China is saying, look how beautiful my system of government is. Surely you want to be part of what I can offer. Is that, am I reading that right? Well, I think not 100%, if I may uh, say so, Humphrey. I think what the Chinese government wants to do is that they are not going in to try to change democracies and turn them into authoritarian states. But they would be perfectly happy to support such a transition, which from their perspective, in the last five years, well, it was happening a bit, wasn't it? Did the American democracy show how it could change? Did the assault on Capitol Hill not happen? Did Donald Trump not become president of the United States? Did the United Kingdom not change in the way how it behaved? 
when it complained about China not adhering to international treaties like over Hong Kong, did the United Kingdom not sign agreements and then say that, well, actually, we don't really mean that. We mean something else. That agreement doesn't stand. So I think what he's trying to do is to present that the Chinese approach actually is superior to the other countries, but not specifically trying to subvert the actual democracy. So slightly different from the uh, American approach of making the world safe for democracies, which involve direct interference in other countries to try to promote democratic development in those countries which are not democratic. Then when you say requires respect, and to the audience out there, it seems that my face is gone. So <laughs> I will I will uh, take this on and then we'll try and get it back. Um, but when you say requires respect, Steve, there'll be a sort of clash, won't there, as how much it requires respect to then how much people are willing to give it and then and then do the, do the guns come out of the holsters? Well, what Xi Jinping always said is that China is completely and totally peaceful, and even a solution over Taiwan will be completely peaceful. All that is required is that if the Taiwanese surrender, force will not be used, and therefore the solution will be completely peaceful. Now, in terms of the um, more general commanding respect. The Chinese government, uh, I think this actually predates uh, Xi Jinping. The Chinese government has been for quite a while now, been very, very keen to promote and project soft power. What the Chinese government doesn't quite understand is that efforts to project soft powers often will become counterproductive. Um, unlike, say, thir 30 years ago, China, when China really had very little scope for soft power, China today has enormous potential for soft power. It is having a lot less of it because of the implementation of the wolf warrior approach to diplomacy, particularly in the last two years. If we go back to before the pandemic, and if suddenly, hypothetically, the Chinese foreign ministry it ceased to exist in 2019 and did not do anything through 2020 to today. I think China's standing in the world would probably have been higher. But by the Chinese foreign ministry's very assertive, aggressive approach to command and require respect from the rest of the world for what China has achieved, that actually turned a lot of people and governments away from looking at China as a benign force to become very suspicious of the intentions of the Chinese state. That's a very big, um, big point there. Continuing apologies, we're going to fix uh, fix the screen in a minute, but I wanted to bring us, thank you, Steve, please, please stay around. We're now going to, to D.D. Kirsten Tatlow, a senior fellow at the Asia program, uh, the German Council on Foreign Relations and also a senior non-resident fellow at the Project Synopsis in Prague. Uh, Didi's latest book, uh, co-authored and out this year, China's Quest for Foreign Technology, Beyond Espionage. Uh, and she's going to give us an insight into what she describes as China's neo-totalitarian rise and how its goal is to manage or directly or indirectly control the world by 2049. Not so much a Cold War as a messy wrestle, she says, uh, we were discussing whether that was be a martial arts wrestle or a sumo Japanese wrestle before we came on. I love that. Didi Kirsten Tatlow, the floor is yours. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed, Humphrey. And thank you for the chance to be here with everyone today. Thank you to Lord Bruce. Yes, a messy wrestle. Um, I say that because it's clear how intertwined uh, on a business, but also on a science and technological level, um, at this point, the economies of um, developed industrialization, industrialized nations outside of China, such as in the West, also Japan and Korea, very, very important, and China are. You know, we had 40 years of um, engagement, driving cooperation forward, deep entanglement, if you like. So how does one even begin to sort of unpick 
some of this very large um, entanglement uh, on all levels, if one then begins to sense, and senses quite strongly, in fact, in some places at this point, um, in the United States, even here in Italy, where I am today, um, in Rome, certainly, that um, some very specific aspects of the Communist Party of China, its plans, its nature, if you like, the nature of the Communist Party, what it intends for the world and for its people, um, keeping in mind the situation of the Uyghurs in the far west, you know, the crushing of um, political uh, freedoms in Hong Kong, um, what it means for democracies and what are we going to do about it? Because this is, after all, a rising power. It's a country, but it's also a civilizational power. And um, it's a very profound question. So I'd like to pick up on something that um, Steve said just now, um, the issue of the uh, contest of systems, if you like, that the party pushes its own system as somehow intrinsically better. Well, the party is always... Um, seen the United States as a great competitor. It's always had it in its vizier, if you like, ever since Mao's days when Mao would uh, complain about the United States and said that uh, China would overtake Great Britain in 15 years, for example, and the US in 50 to 60 years. More recently, um, Xi Jinping, the general secretary of the Communist Party, quoted uh, Deng Xiaoping, the leader from um, after Mao died, and said, you know, quote, we are carrying out socialist modernization to catch up with the developed capitalist countries economically and politically to create a higher and more effective democracy than the capitalist countries. Moreover, we will train more and better skilled persons than in those countries. Now, what we have here is a clear statement of political ambition to overtake, to be better than, to conquer, if you like, in a sort of a, um, not necessarily by, by use of force, but politically, um, economically, um, these d democratic systems of the capitalist so-called West. Uh, the only problem with any of this, in a sense, if you like, is that um, the system that China wants to dominate is a it's a Leninist system. It's a is a dictatorship. The people um, are, you know, uh, the people are. They must. Um, they are controlled by the party, and the party is the vanguard of the people. That's the only way in which it functions. So we've got a really big problem. Now, I want to um, focus on our work. Of course, has been about um, science and technology as a vector for China's immense rise, and it's absolutely true that it has been, and why it's so significant that we continue to allow all kinds of technology um, to go to China. Um, from developed, uh, more developed industrialized countries, because this has really been the basis of China's massive economic surge since 1978, as well as, co of course, um, the very hard work and genuine ambition, understandable ambition of Chinese people themselves. Um, so regularly, Chinese leaders, including Xi Jinping, say things like um, science and technology is the major field of uh, contest, contestation between the great powers or between the rising powers, between us and America, essentially, or ch between China and the West. And this is absolutely correct because, um, you know, um, because China was awfully behind when the Communist Party seized power in 1949. Um, it had gone through civilizational um, decay, if you like. Of course, the Republican period from 1911 was, was very fertile in many, many ways and extremely interesting. But um, what China sought and wanted was a massive transfer of science and technological strength from these industrialized, developed Western democracies and Japan um, that could then make it also big and strong. And uh, we basically saw that happen. Um, it's really extraordinary how little we understand um, outside China of the detail and the scope of the system that the Communist Party built up to identify and to um, transfer back to China the technology, te technology, excuse me, of uh, which has made the which made the West so strong economically after you know this whole process process of science and the Enlightenment and created great power and wealth, um, and it's really done that through a series of very a very broad series of tactics, policy papers, party pronouncements. Um, 
um, you know, building up a political network through many um, different avenues, including the United Front, of which we're beginning to hear more and more, um, but also from the Ministry of Science and Technology, science and technology diplomats stationed in Chinese embassies and consulates around the world. There are 52 that we know of. Um, who play a very important role in all of this in actually identifying what Chinese bureaucrats in China from the Ministry of Science and Technology believe they need in terms of technology and then actually identify companies where they're stationed and say, well, this company, perhaps you could invest, this company, maybe you can buy, um, you know, and actually just connecting things up with these sort of wish lists. And um, what's so important about this, of all of this is, is of course, because uh, technology isn't just technology. Technology has always led societies. We've always seen that in 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 all over the world, really. Um, technology is also, you know, it's an economic force, but it's also state building. Technology builds states through whether you want to say through surveillance or any kind of communications, and you know that's why in the um, introduction to our book we actually said that you know this book is about china's rise as a neo-totalitarian technological power neo-totalitarian because of the technology and the immense force it can give to a leninist state and this was made possible through access to science and technology that was created by countries it now challenges for global leadership so that's a very holistic sentence i think and it really sort of sums up the kind of the strange position we're in um I don't want to take up too much time in this um, speaking portion, or this uh, a direct address portion, but I think, you know, to pick up, up again, I want to, on what something that Steve said, um, it's absolutely true that this competition in some senses for China um, rests on seeming to be better um, to out to beat the United States through technology and science, through you know AI capability, through military capability, which is what it will be because we're dealing with the military fusion system in China. So you know anything you export from ballpoint pens to sort of hypersonic missiles or the parts of them, um, it's always this lingering sense that it um, could very well end up in a military system. Um, that's China's system of. Um, it's just how it, how it works. It's a fusion system. Everything comes together. You can't separate things out very well. Um, but I think they, it's true that they don't want to sort of maybe um, directly um, sort of conquer or control us because after all, that would be a really a lot of work. Um, but they do want to pacify us, I think. I think they do want to make sure that the rest of the world doesn't threaten the Communist Party system. And that, that does entail um, real... Um, um, sort of outreach into and quite aggressive reach into our societies and this is being developed all the time through propaganda methods and again through um, business ties through creating dependent constituencies outside of China so that China becomes the um, strong gravitational force of the world as Li Keqiang said in March in his annual work report and um, again once more uh, science and technology transfer because this really is the road to power for China and we're doing a pretty bad job right now of um, stopping that transfer. Um, in our book we identified 32 methods whereby it's happening, eight are legal, eight are um, six are illegal and eight are grey zone and we need to do a lot more. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, very much indeed for that. Um, this technology transfer, it's the root of power, it's still going on. And, and you just mentioned it at the end, you gave the percentages of what was illegal and what was, was legal. It was what I was going to ask you. But but on the illegal stuff, how illegal is it? I mean, do people get arrested? Do companies get closed down? Or do they just get a wrap over? Listen, who's policing it? Yeah, well, good, great question. Countries um, do, in the EU, for example, we do have... Um, some we are trying to stop the type of inward investment whereby uh, the CCP does very uh, kind of um, uh, in a very focused fashion attempt to take over specific technologies. Um, in the UK right now, you're actually pushing back against investment in your nuclear um, power system, which is a very very important thing. Um, in Germany, where um, it's a very mixed picture, we've now got. Um, China, uh, the state-owned shipping company Costco, uh, seems to be um, have or to be purchasing 35% of a port in Hamburg of a 
terminal in a port in Hamburg. This is, of course, critical uh, infrastructure for Germany. And so far, we have not seen pushback on that. So how illegal is it? I mean, this type of purchasing stuff is not illegal. That would come under legal transfers, yeah? Right. Um, but we've got illegal transfers, such as outright espionage, which is why our book was called... Um, you know, China's quest for foreign technology beyond espionage, beyond, yeah. because right, <laughs> right, right, because because in fact, about ninety ninety five percent of the of the technology that is going to China, and also the knowledge, simply the the, the knowledge in people's heads. I mean, let's not forget the PRC has sent approximately six million um, very intelligent, you know, highly educated, motivated students abroad to precisely to absorb, as they say all this foreign technology since 1978, it's a lot of people. So espionage would be the hard edge of things, if you like. And then in between the gray zone stuff, we've got, um, we call it extra legal because very often we simply can't see what's going on. We don't have access to China. There's no reciprocity. It's not an open society. We can't see what's happening on the ground there. But we do know that stuff is happening like technology transfer parks or dream gardens, they call them. Um, where people come back and commercialize their technology that they've gained elsewhere. And this has been going on for decades. But just one very brief example, if I may, about something would be a um, extra legal transfer would be um, these overseas scholar returnee facilities. They go back from the outside world um, to China. They commercialize their what they've got or technology transfer centers, um, foreign based alumnus associations or document acquisition facilities where China's would sort of trawl the world. They've got tens of thousands, probably about 100,000 people specializing in this kind of stuff to sort of trawl, this, trawl the world for things like PhDs in obscure locations, journals that have published interesting articles. Just take it all, get it back, process it, digest it, use it. This is, but, but the, it seems because, I mean, I'm told, I don't know, you, you, you probably know, that they're way ahead of us when I talk about us, the West, in, in, in stuff like quantum and AI and that they're sort of good artificial intelligence that short but it's up to us isn't it I mean you know it seems that they're you know some of it's illegal but a lot of it is legal and they're just doing what any any person would do would is sort of grabbing learning uh, developing um, and, and all. so it's up to us to stop it but we don't really have that mechanism to do it right it, it is in some ways, although I would say that um, the, simply the nature of the Communist Party and how it operates in the world through these sort of covert political structures, such as the United Front, um, means that there's always this sort of difficulty in saying that something is actually kind of fully visible or fully um, in some ways equal to like our structures or is in some ways transferable these types of behavior because there's always a point at which it sort of slips into stuff that is suddenly very secretive and very coercive and very um uh, can be coercive or is covert so you've always got this sort of you know inter interaction and that's to do with the nature of the party but you're quite right we need to be doing so much more to control our outflow the problem is that we um still fail to understand the problem by and large so, so you call it a messy wrestle, not a cold war confrontation. Can I bring Steve back in for just a second? Because I forgot to ask him, Steve. Uh, cold war confrontation, or is there another word for it? Just give us one word or one phrase for the situation we're in. I think we are looking at a competition, a system competition. I mean, I, I, I prefer the beauty competition because uh, that is something which uh, is more appealing to third parties. But it is a system competition. A, a competition. So competition and a messy wrestle. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dee Dee. We're, we're now heading to Dr. Martin Thorley, who's a research fellow at the University of Exeter, who's looked very closely at the links between the powerful and influential, what the academics call the elite, mm -hmm. in China and Britain. Uh, he's going to be arguing that the term Cold War is not suitable for the situation we find your, ourselves in today. And Martin, be warned, you will be asked what your phrase is for the situation we're in today. You say we must prepare for a different type of encounter. Martin Thorley, take the floor and explain. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Humphrey, and thank you kindly for inviting me to take part today. I'll speak for around 10 minutes. Let's begin. Now, from the two previous speakers, you've heard two excellent summaries that covered the party state itself and party state engagement around foreign technology. With that in mind, I'm going to open things up slightly further still, recognizing that 
whilst the Chinese party state's global approach is forged in Beijing, it's tempered by the international landscape and constraints that places on strategy. Um, it's in examining this particular landscape that one can better understand how Chinese party state strategy might develop as well as its likely efficacy and impact. As well as looking toward the international, I will go beyond the states themselves, believing along with British academic Susan Strange, that intergovernmental relations are to the international landscape, what diplomatic history is to international history. In framing this discussion, and as you just alluded to, Humphrey, I will first state that I consider the term Cold War um, useful only in one respect, and that is describing the scale of the challenge. Otherwise, I think that in a world networked by transnational linkages, the term Cold War speaks to a time that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and it might be detrimental to our worldview and indeed calculations. I think there isn't really an easy catch-all term, but we face less of a Cold War, more of an uneven engagement, and less of an iron curtain, more of a wire mesh. Now, in discussing Chinese party state engagement with the wider world, let's begin with the past seven days. I think they highlight very clearly what is going to be a gulf between commercial and non-commercial actors, a crucial detail. You don't need me to retell the particulars around the scandal connecting tennis star Peng Shui with the highest echelons of the party. But let me say that it has been a disaster for the party state messaging abroad, and not without good reason. It's important to acknowledge that the abrupt radio silence from Peng Shui after she raised the allegations, followed by a very awkward party state drip drip of evidence attempting to allay fears for her well-being, is not a departure. The only surprising element of the episode was the Women's Tennis Association's decision to take a reasonably firm line on the matter. Typically, a commercial or commercially driven entity would be willing to frankly debase itself to sustain market access as long as there is some form of plausible deniability. At the same time as this scandal and other scandals like this, um, commercially driven linkages continue to develop almost unhindered. Let me unpick that slightly, offering two examples from last week, both of which overlapped with the Peng Shui case. Importantly, what I'm going to tell you is a typical week. Example one, then. On Friday last week, party state media reported a meeting between Vice Premier Liu He and representing the group Jardine Matheson, Ben Keswick. The Hong Kong-based British MNC is one of the original Hong Kong trading houses and an illustrative example in this instance. This is a Fortune Global 500 company and one that generates over half its profits in China. The content of the meeting will be unsurprising. Keswick declared that, and I quote, China has achieved remarkable results in its response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and its economy is full of vitality, stating also that Jody Matheson will continue strengthening its business development in China. Now, the group's continued success is dependent on its linkages in China, hence meetings of this nature. There are many more like that. Looking in the other direction to the British side of this equation, however, we begin to see the type of engagement that it engenders. The family have donated vast sums into British politics, typically through the family patriarch, Sir Henry Keswick, to the Conservative Party. This includes £100,000 in November 2019, £103,000 in May 2017. £90,000 one month prior to that in April 2017, another £100,000 in December 2014, and much, much more besides. These donations have allowed entry into the so-called Conservative Party Leaders Group, and Sir Henry has attended at least eight of these meetings. He's met with David Cameron, George Osborne and Vince Cable. That was in June 2014 alone. Boris Johnson in 2017, Theresa May in 2018. More recently, multiple meetings with Greg Hans MP. In addition, Jody and Matheson have been invited to at least 15 meetings with government since 2012, discussing a range of issues, but including opportunities for the UK and China and UK trade policy in Asia Pacific. 
Now we can begin to see the forces shaping the reception of the phenomena that the two previous speakers have discussed. This is but one example of very many. These details may seem distant from Beijing as we assess the manner it will engage with the world beyond its borders, yet they too are crucial. Let's look across the channel and consider engaging in tech, an issue of great importance that the previous speaker touched upon. Also last week then, it was reported that the Chinese semiconductor group factory, uh, that's uh, Xiren Ma, is now making solid headway in France, thanks to its connections with Airbus and indeed those inside the French parliament. Two months ago, Chinese party state interference in France became a big story when a report on the matter was published. The same month, Fattery was hiring Nova Ducrot, a senior executive and previously Beijing-based president and CEO of Airbus Helicopters China for 15 years. In his new role, Ducrot reports directly to the chairman of Fattery, Nye Yongzhong, or Bill Nye. Vinit, could you place the first image up? Thank you. Um, now, Nye visited France in 2019. And this image shows him in the centre, meeting with Jean-Michel Mies on the right, an unmarshed politician, National Assembly member, and importantly, vice president of the Cyber Security and Digital Sovereignty Study Group. Vinit, could you place the second image up, please? This second image shows Nye back in China. For someone in a role of this nature, it is inconceivable that he would not be enmeshed in the party state in some way or other. This image shows me as speaking as a member of the Chuanzhou CPPCC. That's the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, part of the United Front. I won't go into details, but the CPPCC is a major part of the party's wider engagement with non-party elements, including those abroad. Thank you, Pete. Again, to emphasize, these are not special cases, and this is not a typical week. I'm sorry, this is a typical week. Had this talk taken place a week or two earlier, then I expect I would have spoken about, for example, PWC's expansion into China. This is what engagement means in its present form. One must be clear eyed about this and then proceed accordingly. Now, I don't wish to pick on the individuals involved in these cases, but merely to reveal the landscape. To conclude, I hope these, exam these simple examples, in fact, show the talk, the talk of the Cold War draws one to think of states and espionage and perhaps even military engagement. Now, these elements still exist, but in the transnational world, we must apply greater attention to a new arena one of revolving door appointments, offshore capital linkages, multinational corporations that depend on Chinese market access and the manner in which they can be used as channels of influence. In short, the environment as it stands and the challenges engendered by the changing global conditions, including Chinese party state activity, should serve as a reminder that amongst the other challenges, one must keep one's own corner now, there is plenty more to say on the matter, but for reasons of time pressure, I should leave it there. I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Martin, thank you. That was fascinating. <clears throat> I would just like to encapsulate it really into your definition, if I've got it right, is that because um, we've had messy wrestle competition, you've okay. created a wire mesh. Is that right? And, and the way you've described it, you have parallel things going on. You have these very intricate, um, commercially intimate in a way, relationships being set up with the influential and powerful that you outlined in detail to get things done and open doors and I presume set up factories and all that sort of thing. And then underneath that, you've got what's in our headlines, which is our aircraft carrier going or our carrier group vessel going through the Taiwan Straits and the Hong Kong issue and the Xinjiang issue. Are we, are there parallels here to Henry Ford dealing with the Nazi regime in the 1930s? Or are we in a completely different phase now 
whereby and then ha and and how do the two of them ever come together because at some stage these two forces are going to have to clash aren't they yes um i mean i would say that i don't think there's an as easy a term as cold war in that instance i would i say at, at the moment we have a form of uneven engagement and instead of the the um iron curtain i would say there's a wire mesh because some things pass through very easily but other things get caught and that's crucial um in terms of your second question there yes the one of the points the central points i wanted to highlight here was this uh commercial versus non-commercial mm. it is an increasingly an increasingly important goal and frankly if it continues the way it's going the center will not hold uh, that is going to be a very big problem and i would say a, a prudent government would be thinking about that and thinking about short term medium term uh, long term about this particular question and um, just to touch on your, your final point there about ford um you know I, i'm always wary of going back to uh, say you know to nazi germany so there, there probably are parallels here and just to give one example um there's a lot of talk at the moment about hollywood and about studios and the yeah. way in which they engage china there was an excellent book written, oh, I would imagine, about a decade ago now, and it went back to Hollywood studios um, around the time of the rise of uh, the fascists in Germany and about the manner in which they changed the content so they could secure the German market. Which is a very right. interesting parallel and, and touches on, uh, on what you're saying there. So, yes, there are parallels there. However, um, I don't think, I think, you know, there are limits to that comparison as well, obviously. Yes. No, I mean, we did. And I don't like going back either. Absolutely, as you say, but because of we're getting now these comparisons, particularly with the Xinjiang camps and the, mm. the, 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 you know, and then the genocide allegations or, or the, mm. and all of that sort of thing. You know, it, it does strike you. Are we in a situation whereby there's this sort of commercial interlocking that there was in just before the First World War? Um, and, uh, and 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 with Germany and that and uh, and and how do we deal with it? Because you've got these two things. Thank you for that. You're down. I've got you down as wire mesh. Okay. So uh, so we'll see what our next speaker, Dr. Yuka Kobayashi, a lecturer in China and international politics at the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. Uh, and although uh, not very frequently now, but I must mention it, a visiting research professor at Nankai University in China. And I mention that because it means that at some stage you have had uh, a, an academic foot in both camps. So you can shed light on that for us, perhaps. Um, now, you, you brand those who talk of Cold War and confrontation as myopic. Uh, and that the two of the biggest challenges today, climate and COVID, you quite rightly say, require global cooperation. But say the other camp, and we've touched on this before, how much of that can be seen as appeasement? I will be asking you at the end of this how you define the situation. But Dr. Yuki Kobayashi, for the moment, the argument is yours to win. Thank you very much, Humphrey. And thank you very much, Lord Bruce, for the invitation to um, this interesting um, debate. Um, I'm really first going to structure my talk first about sort of unpacking um, China's goals and then ex examine what does that lead to in terms of this where are we headed, what should the international community do in this respect. Now, the beauty of going last is what I can say is that I agree with a lot of everything uh, that's been said so far, and I can actually tap on to the discussions that's been really outlined. So I'm actually going to define China's ambitions by this China dream or the two centennial goals of really rejuvenating China and I agree wholeheartedly what Steve has actually outlined in terms of what are she's ambitions and that's going to allow me to sort of tap into the discussion about how do we actually go forward as a Cold War confrontation and I think the examples that Dee Dee and Martin actually showed are really useful to understand that it is not a smooth way forward at all so when I say that labeling this as confrontation or Cold War I'm not not saying that we should be a doormat for China in the sense that there are a lot of issues that need to be outlined. If you look at China's rise and what's been happening with South China Sea, East China Sea, you're seeing
seeing a lot of confrontation around um, freedom of navigation. And that's something that has to be acknowledged. We need to have guidelines and what Biden said in terms of guard, um, guardrails, right? In terms of defining the parameters of this relationship. And I think that's really essential. So I'm not really um, diminishing this kind of level of um, competition between um, China and the rest. What I'm saying here is that there are a lot more dangers in going through this um, strategy and trying to examine this with this kind of Cold War lens. And I'm going to define this by really looking at three areas of why we shouldn't really use this. And it's really um, uh, echoing with what Martin said earlier in terms of this is really a very different kind of an environment when you compare the US USSR competition. Russia was never entangled economically with the United States, as we haven't really seen it really, um, uh, like that in the past, but now it's globalization. And we're seeing the two um, the economies and the supply chains very much entangled. So it's a very different situation that we see today. So it's very different to the Cold War kind of narrative. And also, if you look at this, whether we can frame this like as an ideological competition. So as Steve said, this is Xi Jinping thought is really not an ideological competition at the international level, at least, right? So if that's really true, then it really does actually try to look at what we're seeing today in a very different way if we put this Cold War lens. Because secondly, it is not really a divide between China and the rest, or like we saw between US and the USSR. There is no ideological competition. It's hard to define what they're really competing about and how to really frame this in ideology. And thirdly, I think there are more dangers if you go down this road. And so for the remaining time, I just want to unpack a little bit about the second part of what, why we shouldn't frame this as a Cold War kind of um, uh, analytical framework. So firstly, we already outlined this is not really Xi Jinping thought, the white book you know, of Xi Jinping writing about his ideas is really not about this idea ideological competition internationally. And it's really about Chinese solutions. And it's quite interesting because when I have this conversation in um, places like Geneva and I'm talking with sort of like developing countries, you'll see that you, uh, is places like Burundi really have a lot to learn from the Chinese solutions. So when I have conversations with them, it's not really about ideology, but they're attracted to the Chinese experience. So in a sense, it's not really about this kind of Cold War narrative of ideology. And secondly, whether or not, you know, um, this Chinese models, chi is China really trying to make it, you know, projected internationally? And I think in a sense, China is really supporting authoritarianism. I would agree with Steve in the sense, if you look at what China is doing in Cambodia with Hun Sen, what China is doing with um, uh, Myanmar, especially leading up to the ICJ case around um, the Rohingya. So in that sense, you see that element, but it's a very different kind of dynamic to this um, so, um, Soviet Union, USSR competition and ideology in the um, Cold War. And finally, we can't afford to frame this in this kind of Cold War narrative. And why is that? And I think really what Martin was getting into, those empirical details were excellent in showing how it's a lot more than just state to state. We have the supply chains and the companies involved. And even if you look at what Didi was talking about in the areas of cyber and, you know, um, in, uh, internet and all of this, um, the um, digital area, if you look at this, it's actually about state real, so using um, losing sovereignty. So you have a lot of multinationals, which are really dictating the ways in which we're dealing with issues like data. And in a sense, this is very much going in transcending across borders. So labeling this with state to state relations in this rigid Cold War framework is actually a little bit misleading. And it could be quite dangerous in the sense that it outlines this kind of tension and confrontation. And which brings me to the main reason why I think we should avoid this language and rhetoric of Cold War and confrontation. And one, I think, significant development we saw in COP26 in Glasgow was Xi Jinping actually getting together with John Kerry and uh, having this joint statement in Glasgow. And this actually shows you if we don't have any kind of commitment from the number one emitter, China, in climate change, you can pretty much um, think that the 1.5 um, degree rise is not going to be actually um, realized. So any meaningful 
international attempt to really mitigate and um, dampen climate change really requires China. And it does require this kind of engagement and bringing China um, together. So this is why the United States sent their special envoy, Kerry, several times to really have these discussions in the lead up to Glasgow. And it's interestingly enough in the sense that we actually have this acknowledgement from both sides. So in that sense, we have an entangled kind of global community, which makes it very difficult to decouple. Secondly, I think in the sense, if you look at issues like COVID, if you look at climate change, these are global issues. And a lot of these global issues are really threatening. Um, and we can see the effects really tangible. For example, why are we having this debate online? The whole reason we're having this debate online is we're actually trying to keep things and commutes really limited. So this is actually a direct impact of having COVID. But this is not a Chinese issue. It's a global issue now. And in terms of how to actually mitigate and control this pandemic, Pandemic, it becomes essential to have information flow, what's been happening, knowledge sharing in terms of the advanced AI ways of Chinese approaching this kind of controlling of the disease. And if you actually shut down all the channels and label this as competition, this is going to be a lot more damaging going forward. So in that sense, a much more fruitful way, I think, of labeling this um, relationship is imagining this as a struggle and um, competition for legitimacy, right? So in the international level, all these countries are really striving for that legitimacy. And I think both China and the rest of the countries are really striving for that legitimacy in the international realm. And it's a competition. And the reason why I label this as a competition is because if you look at even how the United States is trying to build this kind of democratic summit that's going to be happening next month, it's really interesting because the democratic group is very fragmented. If you look at the 77 countries, are they really democratic? It really big, rings sort of alarm bells if you have countries like Pakistan on the list. So in that sense, it's not as US and China led um, ideological conflict as a Cold War narrative would actually assume it is. It's very much fragmented. fragmented. And even if you look at Europe, Europe has actually defined their strategy as being a strategic autonomy, right? So in that sense, they haven't even signaled that they're actually on the side of the United States, which is very interesting. They are actually aligning themselves in the United States with the United States in some respects, but it's not that clear cut as the spheres of influence, the Cold War narrative that we saw in the past. And I'll end my um, talk there. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, that was very well argued. I've got to say, <clears throat> you talk about the struggle for legitimacy. We know that the catchphrases that are coming out of the Hawks on both sides, the Global Times and, and the Hawks and Penny, like this idea, like this confrontational. So we hear it's a Marxist-Leninist state, for example. We hear it's a dictatorship. Uh, we talk about Cold War. <clears throat> These are catchphrases. If you want to diminish that in the conversation to the electorate, the voters who are going to going to vote for our battleships to go out on, what do you when you say struggle for legitimacy, you're actually putting equal legitimacy on both sides. And that's not going to wash in the corridors of power in Whitehall and Washington. Sorry, I'm actually trying to pull things from the academic discourse, which is probably not helpful in this respect. <laughs> but I think um, I've actually tried to encapsulate the debate with the, it's a struggle for what kind of world order we have. It's true that we're actually having a competition. What kind of competition? And a lot of the discourse happening from Beijing has been about a UN-led order, and they're opposing a US-led order, and they're seeing that as very much of a almost a neo-colonial kind of approach. Um, uh, movement. And what you're seeing from the United States is that you have this kind of China threat idea that it is actually threatening when China is actually bringing out their ways of doing things, especially through things like the Belt and Road Initiative. So in that sense, it's both different ways of conceptualizing how the world should be um, ordered or um, organized. So that is kind of in the academic discourse, what we talk about in legitimacy, who is the legitimate sort of ways, um, actors who we can 
can really order um, this world. And it's actually based on the fact who is the hegemonic actor in that. So in that sense, is it the United States behind this US-led order? Or is it the UN behind the UN-led order? And this is really the kind of tension you're having here. And again, it's mixed with definitions like rule-based order, a liberal world order. So in that sense, this is all a struggle about how legitimacy, legitimate we should organize the world. And and they've got a point, haven't they? Because the world order that's most subtle, the rules-based world order, was created in the aftermath of the Second World War uh, by the Americans, essentially. So they do have a point, don't they? Yes. So and, that, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, so could I call your definition of a values struggle? Yes, I think so. Yeah, value-based is often... It's used in the integrated review of the UK. It's used in yeah. um, von der Leyen's statements. It's a value. And I think that's what the policy discourse is, is a value-based discourse. But in the academic discourse, we actually encapsulate that in world order. Brilliant. Now, stay here because we're going to open up to some questions. And because my technology seems to be so ropey at the moment, I'm going to read this this question off the phone and, and, and go to you, Yuka, and then throw it out to the, to the floor because it's an interesting one. It's from... Rimjin Sud says, was America's earlier encouragement of China's rise a huge strategic mistake that can't now be reversed? Uh, we know what that means just to encapsulate is that is that China was led into the World Trade Organization 2001, uh, became very wealthy, um, and then it managed to build the South China Sea Islands, for example, without anybody really trying to stop it. And now we're saying, whoa, uh, it's all gone too far. What, what's your view of that, Yuka? Um, I think this is actually really um, this debate about engagement and containing China. And at, at the point of 2001, China's economy was battering too much for it to be leaving left out of the World Trade Organization. Now, in terms of whether or not they should have actually been able to join at that point when they were not at the same level with a lot of those market economies in the WTO, that's a lot of debate, especially around when China actually came out of their uh, transi uh, transitional phase and became a full-blown member. Now, I'm always one to think that engagement is good. And if you look at the debate around WTO accession, it's similar to the debates around Japan and what happened in the 1960s in the GATT. None of the um, actors really thought Japan would economically rise so quickly to really challenge the United States in the 60s and 70s. And you see this in the GATT's discussion. Now, the number one difference here is that Rising of the economics and basically developing trade is very important in terms of making sure that these um, states are actually stable and become developed um, members of the global community. So I'm all one for actually membership. Now, I think the difficulty is also in terms of looking at what happened in the WTO, which is another issue if you look at the discussion around the WTO reform. And this is where it becomes very, um, really entangled with the messiness of multilateral reform and the difficulties of having consensus around this. But I'm always one to think that having discussions, discourse, and engagement always um, are far better than containment. And it's at the extent that the Chinese economy mattered so much that it didn't make sense for them to be left out. But what happened in terms of the market economy status, that's something where I think a lot of the things went wrong. Steve, Steve has just, thank you for that. Steve has just pulled me up saying that China was very much involved in creating the world order, but was that nationalist China or communist China, Steve? And then, and, and then if you could address the question about, um, you know, have we been, we in the West, been too slow in, in sensing this engagement has gone too far? Okay, thank you, uh, Humphrey. Um, on the purely point of history, the creation of the United Nations was not only Franklin D. Roosevelt's pet project. It was something that China's wartime leader, Chiang Kai-shek, was very committed to from the very beginning after the start of the, uh, the Pacific War. And when the Chinese were first represented at the conference in 1945 for, to discuss the creation of the United Nations, the Chinese delegation 
included senior member, a senior member of the Chinese Communist Party, Dong Bi Wu. So it was not just the nationalist Chinese government that was represented at the creation of the United Nations, the Communist Party was part of it. Oh, so the rewriting of history and said that it is all being created by the um, Western airlines really just is a very Xi Jinping version of history. <laughs> okay. It's very little to do with facts. Now on the point about did we get it wrong about China? Now with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to say that we probably did. But again, I think we have to bear in mind that we can we should not take a determinist view of history. If we go all the way back to the 1980s, at the start of the reform and opening period in China, at some stage in the middle of the 1980s, Hu Yaobang, when he was the general secretary of the Communist Party, even encouraged people to think about the separation of the party from the state. And if at that point, the Western world refused to engage with China, we would never even have presented the option that China could change into something else. Where we probably get, got it wrong was after the Beijing massacre of 1989, when it proved pretty conclusively with blood that the Communist Party was not prepared to change, that it would put the party ahead of the country or any other change of system. We should, by that point, have a clearer view and if we then decide that we still want to try to uh, engage China, we should have engaged China more on our terms rather than on China's terms. If we agree to engage China on China's terms, which China also has a policy to engage with us, I think we're being a bit naive there. Okay, so 1989 is the, it, it is, is, the, is the watermark in a way, although, although I know we've had this discussion before, Steve, that if if they hadn't cracked down in some way or another, because it was the same year that the Berlin Wall came down, goodness knows what would have happened in China that would have actually caused a massive global upheaval. Is that still your view? Well, if um, there were not the Beijing massacre in 1989 and the Berlin Wall came down and triggered all the changes in Eastern Europe, I think there would be a very high chance that China would have followed into that kind of changes. But would those changes have been hugely damaging to the rest of the world? I think probably not. It would be, we don't know what would happen in China. It could destabilize China for a bit before it's found its feet again. But at that point, the Chinese economy was not anywhere near integrated to the rest of the global economy as it is now today. If China were to get into the kind of scenario today of 1989, potentially it could completely destabilize the global economy. Yes. But not in 1989, when Chinese economy was largely con uh, contained in China, with bits of it being reach out, uh, reaching out to the rest of the world. Uh, that's great. I, I want to go to, to, to Didi now. On that same original question about were we naive on the engagement and when should it have stopped. Uh, Steve reckons 1989 we should become more aware because uh, because um, Didi's just uh, messaged me saying that uh, she believes it's an ideological contest between democracy and dictatorship and that there is a real threat underway. Uh, Didi, your views on that? Yeah, I, I do completely agree with Steve about 89 being the turning point and it's very interesting that in fact back then it was really only the human rights folks who were saying watch out, watch out, watch out, don't re-engage in the same way, there's a problem here and, and in retrospect they were right, you know, uh, that's sort of an interesting lesson for us going forward I think, listen to the human rights folks, they have a really good point about most things, um, all things in fact. Um, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say something about um, about this issue about it not being an ideological contest. I understand that there are these arguments that China is somehow not communist, you know, because it's embraced something that seems like capitalism. But in fact, a country that is run by a communist party and very tightly, uh, with all the things that a Leninist party does or a Maoist Sias party, is in fact a communist country, if you like, because it does, in, you know, it is implementing that system. 
And I do think we need to be comfortable about saying that. I think a lot of people are not too comfortable about saying that. Um, and I think that um, you can strip away and say it's not really ideology, it's more about you know, this concept of a very, very tight imperial almost power. I would agree with that. Um, but that in itself is actually a form of ideology. And that's something I think also we need to take on board. So, you know, the open society as we as we have it in some parts of the world, Hong Kong was a fantastic example, has been the open society of Hong Kong has been completely steamrolled by this very powerful concept of the state, of the party state rather. Um, and that does exactly show us, I think, the problem or the challenge that or the threat that China poses. One final thing I'd like to mention, you know, here in Europe and in Germany, I've sort of written about this and talked about this quite a lot, but we really need to get our heads, I believe, around the idea that, um, you know, just how vulnerable democracies are. They always were vulnerable. We saw that in Germany in the 1930s, how they could be subverted by, in, in, you know, actors with intention to do so. Their very openness is turned against them. I think what Martin spoke about, the wire mesh, I think that that shows that how the openness is turned against it um, by determined actors. And what we need to do is um, to focus on a concept of something that, you know, is what I conceive of as democratic security. How do you make democracies more secure? How do you enable that they're both democratic and secure? You can't deliver security. You're not going to you're not going to succeed. You know, security is absolutely necessary. But yeah, we do cherish our democratic system. So I think we need to do a lot more thinking about how to bring those two aspects together. Is it then more than what you is it more than a messy wrestle? Is it a well, it's, sure. No, it's definitely a confrontation and definitely a confrontation of values. Um, and it's also a confrontation of methods, if you like, because the party does do a lot of stuff covertly um, in order to win influence, um, whether by pressure or profit or um, uh, simply by building structures that are rather invisible to us. Yes. Um, in democratic societies. But uh, but I think de facto, it's a messy wrestle, is my point, that this is exactly what is going on. We are literally sort of wrestling with each other. We're going to stick with, with, with messy wrestle for you, but I want to bring Martin uh, Thorley in here with his wire mesh, because this engagement that uh, that comes with, with the question um, that, that was America's earlier encouragement, a huge strategic mistake, in your world, it's still going on, isn't it? The, 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 the rich and the powerful and influential are, are engaging like never before. Yes, it is. And that's why I just wanted to, to speak on it briefly. Um, I will agree with, you know, broadly with what the, the other panelists have, have just said. There's a lot of sense in that. I want to just touch on this to say, um, first of all, the human elements, you know, since the uh, WTO ascension, that has undoubtedly benefited many within China. And on one side, you know, there are many, I've spent a lot of my life there, and it's great to see tangible improvements for many good friends there. On the other hand, and in a more a strict political sense, I think if we look back at that point, it speaks to the very question we discussed today, as you just mentioned. What I mean here precisely is, um, I think the that type of engagement that actually culminated in Chinese ascension to the WTO really, I mean, it began a long time before, but it began in earnest with American MNCs, multinational corporations, in the early 90s. That, that there was a really strong lobbying effort on the United, on the uh, US side there. Now, the reason that's particularly important is twofold. One, it marks a really important moment where maximization of shareholder value overcomes uh, state concerns like sovereignty and security which is vital that's important the mm. second is that i think it also shows why we have such difficulty or why i have such difficulty using the term cold war or why, why you've heard from all panelists they, they take issue with it and that's because in that instance we see that this goes beyond the nation in the sense that many of those groups those commercial groups and indeed elites that benefited that you can argue that they are in some ways users of authoritarian power you know they on their side you know that we think of it in, in terms of nation but they benefit very much you know they have done very well a lot of companies a lot of groups a lot of elites and you can make the same case that even in isolation uh 
that many in, for example, the US, um, they, the, ben the um, effect on them was detrimental. So it benefited one group of US society, but was actually harmful to another. Here's where we break down a little from the nation to nation uh, idea. And that's why I think it's an excellent question. And, uh, and that's why I think it's important highlighting that whilst it's complex, it is important to acknowledge the role of these multinational groups in the early 90s in the US. Thank you. That's that, that, that's that's great. We have a, a, a comment question from Ajay Pradap Singh here, uh, Rator. Um, Post pandemic, the liberal world and China will need to live with their differences and cooperate on the big issues. We, we've heard about this from Yuka, who I'm going to come to now on 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 the pandemic, terrorism, uh, and climate. Uh, and 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 Ajay says as they did during the 2008 nine financial crisis. So we have a track record of in a global crisis, these two powers coming together. Um, so when we're talking now about confrontation, which we've drilled down a bit, you can, how does that work? Um, how do phones get picked up and said, well, uh, hey, I know we've been, uh, you know, fighting over the South China Sea Islands or Xinjiang, but we actually need your help on this. I think in a sense, there's always been an element of competition and cooperation in any kind of bilateral relationship. And I think that Matt, um, the difference is the degree of which um, there's more competition than cooperation. And it's true that when we are hearing this Cold War narrative, this is when we're actually seeing really heightened tensions, especially around, you know, the South China Sea, um, freedom of navigation, cyber, etc. So it is something that was really boiling up. But what the COVID pandemic has really outlined is you really need channels open. You need the cooperation there. And you can have elements of the competition, but I think you really have to have um, this cooperation be always there, even if you're competing. And I think this kind of acknowledgement is definitely there. But if you actually hype up the narrative of competition too much, it becomes very difficult on one hand that if you have sort of the security -ish, um, representatives really battling it out in terms of um, the rise of China, what's happening with the South China Sea um, Islands. And then on one hand, if you have basically the climate envoys talking about cooperation, it's all within the representative of China and representative of the United States. So in that sense, you have to really then calculate whether or not these kinds of conversations and the competition are really having this kind of dampening effect in the cooperation. And especially if you look at values and this kind of element, yes, there's different values, but the number one paramount value is really human life, right? No amount of you know value discourse is really going to actually disregard the importance of each um, the individual surviving through this pandemic. So I think there are a lot of similarities rather than differences that can be actually pinpointed here. And of course, there's a lot of differences in regime. But I think even the Cold War narrative around this Cold War light or what you call this revival of the Cold War narrative around China and now is not really envisioning having any kind of regime change in China. Because if you look at examples like Iraq, what we know is that a regime change is more damaging than not. So a lot of these things, I think, the danger of using and overusing the Cold War narrative is what I think is very damaging, especially since we're actually just had the go, um, COP26 where Xi Jinping didn't come in person. There was not a statement with the UK and China, which already shows that, you know, in comparison to Paris, where there was this kind of Hollande and Xi statement, it's actually pales in comparison in terms of what was actually done. So in that sense, one really needs to think about how damaging this catchy terms like Cold War is. And what I read yesterday in the papers, I think got it really Really right in the sense that it's almost like an opium war reversed. So during the <laughs> opium war, if you think about it, we're reliant on China, right? Yeah. But so in that sense, I think we really need to kind of take everything in balance to see where we're at. It's a very different worldview now, post COVID, than it was before. Okay, can I can I take that question to to Martin Thorley uh, because your research into these elites and that cooperation there that's happened. That's surely a good thing when it comes to making contact and saying, hey, we not need to sort out COVID, we need to sort out a financial crisis, or is it detrimental? 
that is a very difficult question to answer. I will try my best. Um, you obviously want some, you need to keep communication where possible. And I think few would uh, argue with that. I think to address the question directly, um, I would say that how, how to cooperate and on whose terms. There would be one major change, which I think is probably within our gift. Um, and that would be, if you engage with China, you are engaging with the party. It, that's really crucial first, because we engage at many various levels. And um, The party is a bad thing, is it? Because if you engage with Britain, you're engaging with the ruling party and the government, aren't you? Oh, well, I, I, I would say that the two examples are incomparable. So let's say you're working with a company here in the in the UK. Okay, yeah, there are regulations. There might be there's some linkage. You're dependent on the laws. But if you deal with the media, um, it, it, the judiciary, the police, any major organisation, any trade union, you're dealing with the party, and you're dealing with a group that will put its interests even before that of the country. So it's a really different form of engagement. With that in mind, I would say that when we think about the different types of engagements and how we could improve it, just in terms of a of a short as short an answer I could do, I would say that we need to accept that there's this latent network that these organisations within China do eventually pull back into the party through various channels, and then in terms of our own engagement, I think we need to think about that when we engage primarily, especially from a commercial point of view, and when commercial actors do that. That's because one commercially way. you're engaging with the party too. So yeah, with, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was the issue over Huawei, wasn't it, and everything. You know, mm -hmm. it says it's a, an independent entity, but actually it's not, and nothing is in China. Yeah, I mean, it's implausible. It just it can, A really significant organisation always goes back to the party. It cannot yeah. be any other way. So yes, um, we just need slightly more realism on how we engage in that way. So I can't give us you know, a strong answer on how it's going to cooperate, but that would be one way to improve in the short term. Right. Um, Didi, you, you're, you've mentioned, you've sent me a note about cooperation. Uh, not very good. Tell us about it. Obviously um, positive things, but they need to be, um, I think we also need to understand their limits in the sense that um, just using the example of COVID, I honestly don't believe that having been um, overall nicer to China prior to the outbreak of COVID would have had made much of a difference in terms of being able to figure out what on earth it actually was. Because let's not forget that back in 2003, which is when I went back to Beijing as a journalist for them and was there for the next 14 years, um, you know, we had a terrible SARS-1 outbreak. And in fact, back then, China never uh, permitted any kind of independent investigation, um, whether led by the WHO or not. Um, a true investigation, remember the one that happened now was not an investigation, it was just a sort of a report. They reported on pre-investigation by the Chinese side. That's all they were allowed to do. Um, so it didn't work back then either. So I'm not sure that in this specific example, that the, the, the more cooperation always brings greater things or more or more you know dialogue that 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 logic really holds here and in fact i would like to sort of just say that i think that china does have a rather zero sum um view of um international relations uh, and, and this has to do with the nature of the communist party if we take australia as the example Australia pushed back in several ways against China recently and has been harshly punished for it, including with calls to control its domestic media, stop all those sort of pesky journalists uh, and a whole bunch of other things, you know, trade we know about, research. But Australia didn't just, if you like, in bunny ears, push back over COVID by wanting exactly that independent investigation, um, a verifiable one. It also was... Um, increasingly uh, resisting what China was doing in Australia in, in its sort of networks and through cyber espionage, for example. For example, the Australian parliament was hacked, they believed by China. Um, the Australian National University, the ANU, were the, the Chinese hackers, they believe, were in those systems for months. And, you know, the ANU, of course, is the national university. It trains a lot of diplomats, a lot of security, a lot of defense people. Um, this is a prize, as a crown jewel for Australia, you know, um, and this stuff was just happening. And at some point, the Australians said, this is too much. You know, you've got to stop. You've got to get out. Um, and what happened? Massive pushback, um, official and unofficial um, 
boycotts and uh, attempts to, to change trade terms and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, and, you know, and now the submarine security pact with the US and the UK, which sort because of... it right, a yeah. good point because Australia understands very well what are the security realities and what is the nature of the Communist Party that they are dealing with. Um, we're going to, we, I see that Barry Gardner is with us um, and, and thank goodness, so we're going to get a great summing up from him in, in a few minutes, uh, but I'm going to push out the last question from Prashant Kumar that I've saved till the last. Uh, Prashant Kumar says, is the US-China Cold War situation likely to turn hot? We just, we just stumbled upon, but naturally the, the submarine pact with the UK, the US uh, and the rest of it. Uh, Steve, um, you sent me a note saying cooperation on whose terms. Tackle that and also tackle, is this Cold War going to, or not Cold War, because we've decided it's not, is whatever happening now going to turn hot? Absolutely. I think to the previous question, in terms of cooperation, no sane person would say that we should not cooperate. But on whose terms do we cooperate with? Now, the Chinese government is very clear in terms of whose terms it is. It's on the Chinese government's terms and on Chinese government's terms only. We have seen how the Chinese government effectively um, take over some of the UN agencies so much and so effectively that some of the UN agencies have completely changed in terms of what they are meant to do. It wasn't that long ago when we still have a UN uh, High Commission for Human Rights that regularly China was a significant subject of discussion. And there was a time when human rights abuse in China was significantly less than the human rights abuse we are seeing in China today. With the reorganization of the UN Human Rights Organization to the Human Rights Council, of which China became the founding member and has since managed to fill it mostly with friendly airlines uh, in the council, China doesn't get discussed very much, even when there are very systematic abuse of human rights in Xinjiang against the Uyghur minorities. And this is how cooperation uh, happens uh, on neutral grounds beyond the kind of things that DD has been talking about. On the issue of whether there is going to be a hot war, I think that is really all about Taiwan. And Can I just ask you a specific about Taiwan? Is that most of what China has been doing is sort of pragmatic, but Taiwan seems to have an emotional element attached to it that might make it do something that is not pragmatic, because it doesn't need it to expand for its economy, for its status in the world, does it? So is that emotional against the pragmatic element there in Taiwan? I think the Chinese government presented it as a sovereignty issue. But it is much more a due, uh, strategic issue for the Chinese government. Again, if we go back into history, you will be surprised. But one of the original and most uh, strong advocate of Taiwan independency was the Communist Party of China. All through the 1920s into the 1940s, the Communist Party of China advocated the independence of Taiwan. At the Sixth Party Congress of the Communist Party held in Moscow in 1928, is actually in the party resolution that the party would support people in Taiwan to achieve independence as it does, as it did with people in Korea. Taiwan is in the middle of what the Chinese government now call the first island chain. The first island chain was a maritime strategic concept that was developed by the Chinese authorities in the 1980s in the post Mao era. When suddenly with this concept of the maritime, uh, new maritime strategy of forward defense, because China was modernizing with the eastern seaboard being very quickly modernized. They wanted to change the whole equation and develop that defense. And the first island chains go from the southern tip of Japan through Taiwan right in the core of it 
to increase the holds of South China Sea. And if China can hold the first Murray, uh, island chain, then it will be able to push out into the second island chain and divide the Pacific Ocean into the two. And it will push the Americans completely out from the western part of the Pacific Ocean. Okay. It will completely change the equation in East Asia. ASEAN can't will have to do their deals with China. South Korea will have to do its deal with China. Japan will no longer believe in the American defense commitments over Japan. It will either have to do a deal with China or it will have to go nuclear. And the Americans basically will be going home. So, so that just world will change. To sum up on Prashant Kumar's question, you, you're saying it is likely to turn hot and it's likely to not at some stage over over Taiwan. Uh, Didi, uh, uh, in a nutshell, are we going to have a, a hot war? We hope not. Um, as Steve said, nobody in their right mind would want, um, you know, to not have cooperation dialogue and nobody in their right mind would want a war. This is not an appalling idea. But I am truly worried by what I see, which to me seems to be that Beijing seems to want almost to reignite the Chinese civil war. And Taiwan doesn't want Beijing to take it over. So why are they doing this? Okay, I mean, that's a, that's a chilling question. Martin? Um, again, just to echo the sentiments, obviously, hoping desperately that it doesn't. I, I think, you know, there are ways to avoid it. I think Steve is absolutely correct to highlight Taiwan there as the centre. You, know, you, could, you could point to other territorial, other areas, for example, even, uh, say, uh, Tanu Yuri and Kahai, okay, in the north border, there are areas where you could make a case, oh, as well as China holding to its claims, this and claims that. Well, the party is focused on this and it has put it front and center, and that escalates everything. And, um, you know, it's going to make things difficult. I think it can it can be avoided, and, uh, you know, it's, posit it's good to be positive and optimistic about that, but it's going to take a lot of work. And what we've seen recently is perhaps worrying in the sense that we see the party playing more and more to its domestic audience to secure its own position rather uh, at the expense of its global position and that is a worrying trend in terms of the question posed. Yuka, are we heading for a uh, the, the struggle for legitimacy becoming a hot war? I think I'm going to first try to attempt this question by really trying to question whether or not we're giving um, too much credit for China to be a strong superpower. And it reminds me of um, one of the books that really tries to um, examine this question and exposes the fragility of China and the fragility of the CCP. And this is partly why you have this kind of posturing at the international level. And I'm actually quite skeptical about real outright hot war, especially around Taiwan. China relies on Taiwan. There's a lot of inter, um, intertwined economics between the two investments, a lot of the joint ventures in China. So if you look at this, it's equally damaging for China to really obtain Taiwan with their strength. So I think a lot of there's a lot of forces that are actually dampening this. And that's not to say there is not going to be more posturing, but I'm actually quite skeptical about whether or not there's going to be outright war. And it's also more hope, I'm also more hopeful that it won't happen because I'm also um, observing that I think Xi Jinping is quite clever and strategic in their decisions. And in terms of their domestic audience, there's all these other issues like Xinjiang, which is really exposing the fragility of China and the CCP, which actually would damage this kind of regime survival. And I think that might have more of a dampening effect over this. Oh, thank you. Steve, before we go to, to Barry Garden, I just want to nail down with you one thing because you gave us that very detailed sort of strategic outlook. When could this happen? Is that 1949 date of the centenary the one or would it be before that? Well, 2049 is the Sorry, latest date yeah. uh, that could, could happen because 2049 is the date when China will have to deliver us the China dream that Xi Jinping outlined. So it cannot happen uh, after 2049. The likelihood is that it will happen quite a bit sooner than that if China is not being effectively 
uh, deterred. I would say that probably not in the next 10 years, for the simple reason that China does not have the military capability to do that. But once they have built up the military capability to do so, we are in a situation where the Chinese uh, government no longer allowed, or the Chinese leadership no longer allowed other senior leaders within the leadership to contradict the top leader. If the supreme leader says, go, then, then the military will say, yes, sir. If Xi Jinping asked the military, can we take Taiwan? I think Chinese generals and admirals are as conservative and cautious as admirals and generals anywhere else, which is that unless they know they can clearly do it with acceptable cause, they wouldn't want to start a war that they could potentially not win. But we don't have a system where that kind of constraint can happen, and therefore the risk is significant, and we have to engage with the Chinese government effectively to make it very, very clear that such an option, if taken, will be devastating to both sides, and therefore it cannot and must not be taken. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, everybody there. And, and we have with us now uh, Barry Gardner, MP, who's chair of the Democracy Forum. Um, and we're lucky to have him because quite often he's been called away at such a busy time. Now, Barry, could you sum up for us what you've learned and what you conclude from our debate? Certainly, Humphrey. Um, uh, can you see and hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> I, ah, there yes, we go. I can see you now, Barry. Yes, sure, well, I, I do exist after all. There we are. Um, look, for, first of all, I, I want to say thank you to, to all the speakers today. Um, I, I think it's been a fascinating exploration um, of our theme. And interestingly, um, and perhaps unusually at the Democracy Forum, there's been a resounding answer to the question. Um, because the question was Cold War or confrontation, um, and the answer appears to be neither. People are saying, well, it's not really a Cold War, and they're saying, we hope it's not going to be a confrontation. Now, Charles began our, our afternoon um, really with a, a, a very erudite assessment of the uh, the military situation um he talked about the the threatening of us dominance uh, that china posed uh, in the military sphere um and he questioned whether in fact the us and and the west in general were asleep at the wheel but but i think he he also injected that question uh, about the play over Taiwan and whether the objective that China had was to, to lock the US into a nuclear stalemate uh, in order to neutralize their intervention in a conventional war over Taiwan. And, and much of the conversation has focused in and out around that question of what are uh, China's and the, and the party's intentions towards uh, Taiwan. Um, now, Steve centered us down into Xi Jinping thought, um, the reintroduction of ideology, uh, Chinese Marxism, as, as he portrayed it. Um, but I think critically, what he emphasized and what I found very interesting about what he was saying was that he said, but it's not for export. Um, this is uh, the China solution is a Chinese solution predominantly. Um, and in that sense, he was he was saying that it went beyond the Cold War framework. Um, and he spoke in terms of, of a beauty contest. Um, really, is the Chinese communist authoritarian model a better or more successful one than the liberal democratic tradition? Um, and if China is, uh, he, he adopted the Trumpian phrase, the, you know, make China great again. It, if this is about making China great again, um, how, how is China making space for that authoritarian regime? Um, 
is it purely domestic? Is it purely a defensive uh, posture? Or he said, does it require um, respect on the global stage? And again, focused us back on that question of Taiwan and the, the need for the sovereignty of China to encapsulate not only Hong Kong, but also Taiwan. Um, so the question here is, does China have to defeat the US in some way, either by militarily outranking it um, or outswanking it um, in order to retake Taiwan? Um, and are we, in effect, by, uh, by our own laxity in the West, uh, not going to be able uh, to play the strategic role that we might contemporarily envisage for ourselves if and when that, uh, that eventuality comes? Now, Didi Kirsten Tatlow, um, she has a, a fundamental, and I, you characterized her talking about a, a messy wrestle, and, and of course this interplay between the corporate and the political um, is really fundamental. And I want to come back to this when we're talking about uh, what was referred to later on as a value system, um, because I think this is, this is really fundamentally important. Um, but she was, in effect, posing the question of uh, how we protect our open society. Uh, in fact, that's the question that she, she put in our, our private chat. Um, well, there I think we're first forced to, to question our own position and say, well, how open are our societies? Um, and when we come back to this question of values, I think one of the things that we've got to assess is um, when you look at the concentration of power, are we only looking at the concentration of political power, that is power in the hands of politicians, when we talk about having an open democratic society, or are we looking at the concentration of power in the corporate world, uh, in a world where Microsoft can have, uh, you know, a GDP larger than Croatia or, or uh, Walmart larger than Norway, um, the concentration of power in the corporate world um, it is a huge question for us, particularly when it comes to data and Microsoft and Apple and the accumulation of data uh, that we're seeing in the corporate world. Um, so I, I think we really begin to see the merging of, of this whole concept. Um, and she quoted, I, I think she was quoting Xi, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, when she talked about the contest of systems uh, and a higher and more effective democracy. I think he was referring back to, to where that had previously been said. So what here we are the democracy forum um we call ourselves the democracy forum how do we need to interpret that world word democracy etymologically um the demos the common people and the kratos the the strength or or the rule uh, and is it the rule of the common people or is it the rule by the common people or is it the rule for the common people? Uh, and I think there are real questions here which the Chinese perspective has a very different take on uh, to our own. Um, so I, I, I need to, to press on to, to what Martin um, was saying, Martin Thorley. Um, when he talked about the party state and, and he really developed that, uh, that concept of the interlinkages between the corporate and the political world. Uh, and he brought it home, I thought very effectively uh, when he spoke of Jardine Madison and also the donations that had been made to, uh, to the Conservative Party here in the UK and the way in which there was that political and corporate entanglement uh, that was beginning to 
uh, to make it very difficult to separate out um, the corporate and the political. He didn't use the word corruption, but um, at least I don't think he did. Um, but obviously, it's certainly been uh, a word that's been much in the news here in the UK over the past couple of weeks. Um, so this this wire mesh that you uh, you spoke of, Humphrey, um, uh, rather than the messy wrestle, it is where we begin to see the corporate and the political so entangled that the two different political beings are entangled also. Um, and that was when we got on to talking about um, uh, nuclear and, and the involvement in, in Britain's nuclear power and both the military and the strategic risks that there might be there. And again, whether that would mi militate rather that there should be uh, a, a cold threat rather than a hot one, because the commercial prosperity of, com of each country is so intertwined with the other. Um, now, I too um, attended the COP, like Dr. K uh, Kobayashi. Um, I was there for, for all two weeks of, the, uh, of COP26 in Glasgow. And certainly one of the things that struck me and I, I think resonated in what she said for me was when she was talking about climate and COVID and these great um, global issues that uh, need to be addressed. I, I've attended, I think, every COP maybe bar one since, since 2009 at, at Copenhagen. Um, and I certainly felt that this COP it was the first time that I really felt that instead of acting as 198 different parties, uh, each with their own national interests and trying to assert those interests over and against each other, there was much more than previously a sense that this was a, a common problem of a global village that had to act corporately in order to be able to act effectively. Uh, and the other aspect of the COP that I think plays into this was the fact that business and the commercial world for the first time engaged at a much greater level uh, in terms of finance and in terms of providing solutions than they had previously. And so here again, we have that interplay of the political on the one hand, uh, and the corporate uh, on the other, but coming together uh, to resolve um, these global issues, these global problems. And I suppose the question, I, I think she spoke of decoupling. Um, the question is, can we have coexistence of our different views of democracy? Um, and this question of, do the Chinese solutions work? Are they actually achieving um, things that our own system is not able to provide people? Are the inequalities that are now becoming so obvious and so predominant in politics in the West, um, are we beginning to think that, that our political system democratic and liberal as it is, is not actually giving us some of the freedoms that we believe is the essential point of our democratic system. Freedom from want, freedom from hunger, freedom uh, to actually have a, a place to live, uh, a home over our heads. Um, and of course, other more private freedoms, the sorts of privacy, the data freedom, are we able to control our own lives in the way that we want? So when it goes back to values, I think what we've seen this afternoon is a fascinating contest uh, of values. Um, and it's, it's a concern over where power is concentrated. And I think increasingly in the West, we like to focus on the concentration of political power that takes place in, in China, the authoritarianism, the way in which it controls the commercial world. But we pay scant attention to the way in which 
corporate concentration of power is actually controlling uh, people and limiting our freedoms in a very different way in the Western world. So it really is a clash of values uh, that we have here. Um, we can all say, of course, we hope there is not a, a, a hot contest. We hope there won't be that military con confrontation uh, with China. I, I think the real question is how we work out a modus operandi, a modus, a modus vivendi, a way in which we can live together and maybe ultimately um, find a resolution to that beauty contest as to which affords us a better way of living uh, and a way in which we feel that our essential freedoms are respected, both the ones that we treasure in the West um, and also those that might be pointed out we have actually limited uh, by those in China. Barry, thank you very much for that. Could I just trouble you? We have these, this terminology coming forth from the Democracy Forum, messy wrestle, competition from Steve. Uh, why mesh, struggle for legitimacy. Have you got a couple of words that can sum up our situation uh, with China at the moment? Um, coexistence. Coexistence. Okay. Combative or amicable coexistence. We'll go with that. May Thank well be either. May <laughs> well be either. The, the, one, one final thing I would say in, in response, I, I think, to the, the point Steve made about 2049. Um, Steve, I, I've been a politician for 25 years. Um, 25 years from now will be 2046. Um, I haven't a clue what's going to happen in 2046. I haven't got a clue what's going to happen in 2026. And I, I suspect that if we're looking that far in the future, we're actually looking too far. We should focus on what we can do now to enable us to find a way of living together in our global community. And that may be by concentrating on the big global issues that we can only solve jointly because there we have to engage with each other. And the more we engage with each other, the more likely we are to do it in a peaceful fashion. Thank you, Barry. When you become Britain's foreign minister, foreign secretary, we'll hold you to all those thoughts. Um, Didi get, comes in, very last uh, thing, China is already fighting with India on its border. That puts us in a slightly different direction. Thank you all. Next month, Democracy Forum debates South Asia in the throes of an environmental crisis. That's another critical issue uh, with a great panel. Wednesday, December the 15th at 2 p.m. British time. Until then, thank you, Lord Charles Bruce. Thank you, Barry Gardner, Steve Jung, Didi Kirsten Tatlow, Martin Thorley, Yuka Kobayashi, and all of you joining us from all over the world and the team at Democracy Forum that put it together. And from me, Humphrey Hawksley, see you next month. Stay interested, stay involved, and stay safe.